So you decide to restore what goes through your mind. Well, honestly, when I first when I first get the bike, it's like, oh man, it's gonna be so much work. Um, it, you know, I mean, you you haven't done anything yet, and uh, it's a little bit scary to get started. But the first thing that I do is I grab a notepad and I just take a walk around the bike, and you say, okay, what are the obvious things? That this thing is going to need. Um, a lot of times when you go to buy a bike, they'll tell you that everything is there, um, but that's never the case. I mean, the, these bikes are always missing something, and there's always parts that are unusable. Take a walk around the bike and you just write down the obvious things like, um, okay, this is going to need new levers, it's going to need a new chain, um, check the tires, almost always going to need tires. Um, you know, and you take inventory of parts that are in really bad shape because there are certain things that could happen to the bike that is going to make considerable more work for you. So, for instance, if there is damage to the engine, one of the engine cases, then maybe you're going to need to replace it. You gotta take your time, you go through the bike, and you see, okay, this is what I'm working with, these are how many parts that I need to buy, and you go ahead and then you tally those things up and you say, okay, it's gonna cost me about this much to buy the parts that I need, and you make sure that the numbers work, you know, because you're gonna put a lot of time and work into this bike, and you don't wanna spend a ton of money and then end up, you know, losing money on it. So how did you start? Well, um, with this bike, it's a good example. We basically, you take everything apart. Imagine that you're going to detail and restore every piece of this bike. So you need to get down to the engine to be able to do the compression test, which is one of the most important things. You need to be able to have access to the smaller parts that are really hard to reach, parts that are really dirty. Um, there's certain things that you're going to need to replace. So, you know, the first uh, part is really disassembly and you have to pay really close attention to what you're doing. I think we've done one CBR like this before so you have to really pay attention to how things come apart and how they go back together. You need a couple of uh, uh, good tools, larger tools to be able to do the powder coating in a garage. Um, you need a large compressor for sandblasting. You need a sandblast cabinet, okay, for keeping the particulate that you are spraying against the parts. And then you're going to need an oven. Um, our oven, I think we got for like 20 bucks or something like that. <laughs> it's just a home oven, but it's nice. It's, we modified it to be just large enough to fit wheels inside. So. Um, the oven does mostly, you know, what we need it to do, which is great. The biggest thing with the powder coating project was investing in the cabinet and the compressor and then bringing a 220 volt line to the garage from the other part of the home. So that's, you know, that when you're using an oven, you need 220 volts. Not a lot of people have that coming to their garage. So that was one of the biggest projects even getting set up to be able to powder coat. We like to use a bit of lubrication to help us installing the new tires onto the powder coated wheels. And we also have a tool that we've built that we're using here that also helps us to fully install the tire. Um, we're also installing the valves here. Those are what allow the air to come into the tire without escaping. And then, of course, filling them up with air. Uh, the frame on this bike was uh, pretty scary when we first got it because it had a puncture uh, in the side of it 
and that's something that we don't deal with very often, but we know how to deal with it. Um, and luckily, this wasn't in a structural area, um, so it was very much repairable. There's definitely a stigma around any damage to frames, but um, you know we've been welding for years and repairing bikes for a long time now, so that was our challenge for this bike. And um, yeah, heated it up, um, made it straight, did some aluminum welding, and then it was just cosmetics after that. These bikes particularly, they come in a black frame. It's a semi to low gloss black. And um, over the years, we found paints that are really good at matching that. We clean them up really good inside and out, and then we paint the frame up as well. So a lot of times we will buy used parts that aren't necessarily in great shape, but we can always restore them. Um, that's the case with the passenger pegs. Um, these needed to be sanded before they could be sandblasted. And then we could finally go ahead and powder coat them. Um, it is a bit of a long process, but we've discovered that you can refinish most surfaces. And if you know what you're doing and you have the right sandpaper and some patience, you should be able to bring most surfaces to a nice shine. The main function of sandblasting the parts is to create a surface that is rough and that's much better for the powder to stick to. It's actually an electrostatic process. Um, you ground the parts and you essentially send a charge um, through the paint and that causes the paint to stick and then the paint is baked on. And This is done in multiple layers which makes powder coat a very resilient type of paint. The powder doesn't always come out perfectly. I think on this set we had to do it um, a couple of times to get them the way that we wanted, but it's definitely very, very exciting um, to see them finished and ready to be reassembled onto the bike. The next thing, you basically start detailing, and what I like to do is detail every piece before it goes back on the bike. Um, it just feels really good to have a bike that, you know, once it's all back together, that every single piece has been looked at, and it's been made to look as new as possible. So um, that includes detailing the engine. I mean, I get in the engine with a toothbrush, you know, and clean as much as I can. And the areas, even if they don't show, it's just kind of nice to, to know that you know, anyone that's taken this thing apart and see that there's care put into every bit of it. So once the bike is fully disassembled, the first thing that you need to test is the engine. So you need to, um, we have a compression testing uh, set and you essentially you know, connect a good battery to the starter you turn the engine over and you see what type of compression you're getting in each cylinder and you want to make sure that um, the, the compression is, they're all close to each other, the values that you're getting. Um, and you want to just have a look inside the engine, you know. On this bike we opened up the head just to see what was going on inside the head and make sure that everything looks good, that you don't have little bits of metal floating around inside the engine, uh, things like that. So you start sort of with maybe the, the thing that might cost you the most to fix, make sure that you're good in there. Once you have your frame and your engine ready to go, what's Next. So once you have the frame and the engine done, then that's it. the next exciting big step is having a rolling chassis. So you have a bike that will roll around. And so there's a few things involved in that. You got to get the wheels powder coated. You got to get tires on those wheels. You got to get the swing arm detailed. Um, and of course, you're going to need to detail the forks. Um, make sure that the lower triple tree is straight, the upper, the upper triple tree is straight and looks good. We do detailing on that. Um, 
and then the rotors. And we need to make sure that the rotors are straight. So we have a method where you spin it on an, an axle and you can see if there's any deviations. And um, But yeah, once you sort of confirm that all of those the components, the wheels, the rotors are straight, then uh, you can continue with assembling what they call a rolling chassis. So it's basically just something that rolls around, which is kind of exciting. There are a couple products that I find myself using pretty regularly in the shop. Uh, WD-40 is one of those. It's really great for cleaning and it has a lot of other uses as well. So it's just one of those things that you always need to have on hand. In addition to putting something very nice together and being able to exercise uh, a lot of creativity, uh, the time that my son and I spent together uh, solving problems, uh, communicating about everything relating to this bike, uh, is synergizing. It's, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just incredible. It's an incredible uh, feeling. Uh, as a father, I say uh, it doesn't get any better. There are always uh, many uh, issues, cosmetic issues. Uh, it's like they're unavoidable. Uh, for example, the edge of this muffler here had a, a cosmetic crack uh, in this area, had a small dent over here. This is metal, gets really hot, and uh, you wouldn't put bundle in this area. So. Uh, welding could be an option, however, it's questionable as to how well this material on an edge would take the welding and that would be a lot of work. So what, what turned out to be the easiest solution was just a fine JB weld over, over the crack and the, the small dent. When the JB weld dried up, you would sand it as smooth, smooth as possible and then by taping the surrounding areas, only leaving the edge out, and applying uh, a, an engine a spray paint uh, that pretty much uh, matches this color, uh, you're able to hide the, the defect completely. There are so many little mini projects that you get to work on and it's it's really nice because every time you finish one you really feel like you've taken a step towards completing the bike the harness is um, not always fun <laughs> because they get uh, damaged when they're crashed or they're often spliced um, people adding things like light shits or maybe they have a power commander on there or yeah, there's a bunch of different things that it can be done to modify harnesses so you got to go through the wires and there's probably I don't know over 100 maybe 150 different wires and sub harnesses and things so um, basically you look through the harness to see if there's any visual evidence of tampering um, if there is, and you re-solder those connections, you redo them to make sure that they're good, and you can tape it up with electrical tape, which is what they use in the factory. So the next big step after the harness is one of the most exciting steps. It's actually trying to start the bike, you know, get it running for the first time. A lot of the times that we have these bikes, we've never actually heard them run. Um, we've been told that they run, or we can assume that they were running because they've been crashed. Um, so it's a pretty involved process. You got to make sure that all of the safety systems are in place so that the brain of the motorcycle gives the okay to send fuel to the fuel pump. And so you got to check the kickstand, you got to check the kill switch, you got to check the um, tip over sensor, which senses if the bike is upright or not. And once you have all of those in place and all the proper signals are being sent to the engine computer or the ECM, then you get the fuel pump 
front. The big challenge was the gas cap for the tank. Uh, that was so rusted that the lock mechanism was completely bad. It was not fixable at all. So we had to cut a portion of the tank to remove that gas cap and then actually build a lock using other gas caps from other bikes and that's where uh, Julian has some expertise and he'll explain that part. Between the two gas caps I was able to scrape together enough parts to get one good working gas cap. So in this case instead of making a key to work with the lock, you make the lock that works with the key. After checking the engine and making sure that the harness and everything was good, we finally got it to the point where we could test it. And um, it's always tricky to get these bikes to prime the fuel pump because they have a couple of different safety checks in the kickstand, in the kill switch, and the tip over sensor is a sensor that shuts off the fuel of the bikes down. And it sort of, you know, there's a bunch of things that need to be in place, and we're getting the fuel pump to prime, but the bike is not idling it turns over but it won't start essentially so um after quite a bit of research and and looking into it we realized that the fuel system was gunked up so pop those off clean them up using compressed air and carb cleaner then we put the bike back together and guess what so once the bike has been started, you want to listen to the engine. You want to make sure that the engine sounds smooth and you send uh, the revs up through, you know, all the way up high and make sure that it sounds, you know, nice across the range. And then you're going to also want to shift through the gears and make sure that that's happening smoothly. You want to kind of listen for any sounds or any strange noises that the engine might be making. Once you've done that, then you can go on to the cosmetics, sort of dressing the bike up. What I mean by dressing up is all of the cosmetic pieces like the fairings, the seat, um, and then some of the other components like the headlight, um, the fairing stay, windscreen, mirrors, all of these pieces come on last and um, they are what make up sort of the outer portion of the bike so you want those to be looking really good.
It's uh, a part of the motorcycle that gets a lot of attention. Um, it's got some really nice contours in it and it catches the light in a really nice way when the bike's been painted properly. So we are often very excited to install the gas tank. And of course you can't have a shabby looking gas cap on a really nice gas tank. So we always make sure that we detail the gas caps as well. The paint process, obviously this is um, this takes several years to be able to master and learn and we still don't have it mastered, we still make mistakes. I think that um, being able to recover from your mistakes um, is one of the biggest skills that we have in the garage and painting is one of the places where we, <laughs> where we use that skill a lot. Um, even before you can paint, there's a lot of uh, repair work that needs to be done and um, my dad, he does awesome work with plastic welding, which is something that not a lot of people know how to do. Um, but essentially taking broken pieces of plastic and re-welding them together, and then there's a whole big part of the process, which is using Bondo, smoothing out cracks and broken areas to make them look nice and even. Um, then you can start with the paint. Um, Usually the first coat of paint is going to tell you that you have a lot of defects in your bundle work or your plastic welding or you'll find cracks in little defect areas that you didn't see before. So then you're going to do some more bondo, some more detailing. And then finally you can start building up the layers of paint. That's going to need to dry for at least a day or two. And then you can do the clear. Doing clear is exciting because you know that you're very close to being done, but it's also very nerve-wracking because if you screw up the clear, you pretty much have to start over. One of the biggest setbacks that we had on this motorcycle was um, trying to paint the front fender. Um, we had it painted perfectly with... Um, with the clear and everything and I wanted to try something different where I could bake the paint in the oven to get it to dry a little bit faster um, uh, but the front fender just ended up melting completely and we could never get it to take the original shape so we just ended up buying another fender that was in rough shape and repairing that one and just starting over again I think it's pretty safe to say that most of the things that we've learned in the shop have been learning the hard way, that is, making mistakes. Um, painting clear on a white fairing is pretty challenging because it's really difficult to see how the clear is sitting over the white paint. Um, so that definitely takes a bit of practice. So usually at this point in the process, I will make sure that I'm up to speed on the maintenance of the motorcycle. So checking things like the brake fluid and flushing that if I need to, uh, flushing the coolant if the color doesn't look too good, and then of course topping up the engine oil and making sure that that's at a nice level and that the color of the oil is indeed looking good. Once the plastics are um, painted and they have clear on them and they are completely dried, you can handle them and then you can go about installing them on the bike. Um, often there's a lot of hardware that needs to be installed onto the fairings, like little rubber washers and things like this, uh, well nuts and things, so that the pieces can actually fit together and be fastened together 
Um, one of the big issues with this is that often when a bike has been down, um, the brackets that hold the fairings in place have been bent. So getting all of the fairings to line up properly and meet together, it takes a long time and it's, it takes quite a bit of patience because you have to be very careful not to push the plastic harder than you need to instead of moving the brackets around. Like I said, because it's many pieces fitting all together, if you have a bracket in the back of the bike that is off, that's going to affect all the way in the front. So there's, um, there's quite a bit of alignment and patience uh, needed to do this, but, um, but it's also extremely rewarding because you get to start to see how the bike is going to look at the end. By the time you're installing the decals, you're pretty much on the last lap, and it's a uh, it's extremely exciting. Um, but you got to be patient, take your time, and make sure that you are aligning those decals as close to the original OEM decal placement as possible. Um, but there definitely aren't many feelings better than pulling off that masking off of a fresh decal. So how do you make the vinyl look new on a bike like this? Uh, you use uh, a heat gun to stretch the vinyl and uh, uh, gradually in between stretching and stapling the vinyl behind it you are able to remove uh, all the wrinkles. You know you start with the extremes from one side to the other then on a cross pattern you go the other direction again stretching applying heat to allow the vinyl to easily stretch and then after that it's a matter of going after the biggest wrinkles and you start with the biggest one until you get to the little ones and when they're all gone you're pretty much done it's on the windscreen um, which uses well nuts and then the mirrors are usually like one of the last things and maybe usually the very last thing that I'll do is the bar ends and those just help with um, vibration while you're riding um, and almost I don't know 99 percent of the time the bar ends are going to be scraped up from just being little crashes or anything so you you can sand those up with the machine smooth them out and spray paint them again with good strong paint and um, yeah I think my favorite part is when uh, when you're installing the plastics, you're finishing. I mean, you the bike is coming together, and with all the work that we have put into it, uh, seeing the final product and how nice the uh, selection of the powder coating colors the plastic colors, the decals, the, the detailing uh, of the, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the other parts uh, all matching with the black on the frame. It is like seeing the whole package together and, and uh, feeling the satisfaction that you were part of that process. There's a lot of satisfaction in doing a job right and really putting work into the details. And of course, you know, when you finish a bike and you walk around it for the first time and you sort of say, wow, I made that. You know, I touched every, every piece that's there. Um, you know, that's the best. And, you know, just being able to hang out with my dad and hang out um, at home being really creative and solving problems in unique ways. And every bike that we come across is, has new challenges. So that's also amazing is every time you do a bike, you're learning new skills. You're learning how to do things a little bit better than the last time. And it makes you feel like a master. You feel like an expert. Um, once, you, once you get these processes down. Um, but yeah, and then maybe the biggest thing is, is just being able to, you know, not only are you done with something that looks beautiful, it rides great and you get to ride around 
this piece, you know, this this piece of art that you put so much love into and, and you actually get to ride in it. It's really fun.